Hello, everyone. If you are wondering how you could help support the Life of X, you could just head over to lifeofxpodcast.com and click through to our support page. Thank you very much. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Arif Chadala. And my name is Melvin Barnes. And that makes this the Life of X. Melvin, you sound a little different today. Yeah, but it's my long time abroad in China. Oh, actually Taiwan, I guess. <laughs> in Taiwan, uh, the Taiwanese gave you the German accent? Yep, uh, it's back from the colonial past when Germans you know, were carving <laughs> out certain spheres of influence. Well, there you go. If you can't pick up on the sarcasm, dear listener, this is not Melvin Barnes. This is the first of a special guest episode. This is Eric Tadala. And Marcus Schuf. Marcus is a longtime friend of mine and Melvin's. He was a colleague of ours at graduate school at Ohio State University. Marcus, would you like to tell the people a little bit more about the man, the myth, the legend? Marcus yes, Schuf. of course. Uh, I'm happy to do so. First of all, happy to be here in a professional attire, my sweatpants. <laughs> in the recording studio? In the professional recording studio. Reminds me of my time in L.A. when I was recording. <laughs> And yeah, well, who am I? So I'm, I'm just a graduate student, fifth year PhD in the history department. I specialize on U.S. foreign relations with Latin America, especially Brazil. For those of you who have paid attention to politics in Brazil right now, obviously there was an interesting election and you hear more and more about evangelicals. And I'm really trying to figure out what the role was of U.S. missionaries in Brazil to make Brazil a country that now has 30% Protestants. And so that's really what I'm working on. And Yep, I'm also aspiring a historian, just like Arif is. So very, very <laughs> well, happy to be here. I'm a retired aspiring historian. I'm no longer aspiring to be I'm a about to retire. <laughs> <laughs> Marcus is on the verge of retirement, and we are thrilled to have you. And, you know, we've talked about this a little bit in, I believe it was our Andrew Carnegie episode, Melvin and I really enjoyed the process of doing Shanghai Shek in a way that we were on uneven footing in terms of background information. You know, Melvin studies has been studying China forever, and I have not. So I felt like it was a really great opportunity for us to take a deep dive into that topic. And so he and I talked about bringing in some of our friends from graduate school to present a more deep picture of many of these other topics. And so when we decided to do a figure from Latin America, or who was prominent in Latin America, I should say, it seemed only right that we should get our friend Marcus Schuf in the building. Yep. Well, I assume very soon you'll have covered all continents. I'm looking forward to Australia. Yeah, can't wait. <laughs> I don't know who we're going to Russell Crowe, of course. Ooh, <laughs> we'll get Russell Crowe in here to help us without a shirt. Perfect. Okay, so I don't actually think we've mentioned who we're doing today yet. We are doing a name that some of you may have heard of. I don't know. He's really popular in some circles and completely unknown in others. His name is Sam Zamuri. Sam the Banana Man is sometimes called. Broad overview. He's most well-known for running United Fruit Company in the early 1900s. I would say the first half of the 1900s mostly is when he did a lot of his stuff. He's probably more well-known in New Orleans around Tulane University. There's a lot of stuff named after him. He was a big donor there and that sort of thing. And So we're going to dive in a lot more in-depth into his life and into kind of the way that he and the company that he ran affected a lot of global events specifically in Latin America. We based this episode primarily on Rich Cohen's biography called The Fish That Ate the Whale, The Life and Times of America's Banana King. Rich Cohen, for those of you who don't know, is an American nonfiction writer. He is contributing editor at Vanity Fair and Rolling Stone magazines. He has written a few books, Tough Jews and the Avengers, Sweet and Low, Israel is Real, The Fish That Ate the Whale, Monsters, and The Sun and the Moon and The Rolling Stones. And now you might wonder, why did Arif and I pick someone who's known as a banana peddler or even a United Fruit Company? And we've done many reasons. For one is the fruit itself, bananas. We all have probably eaten one. And really, uh, we might not realize at the same time, though, how much bananas are actually consumed. And worldwide, bananas are the fourth most consumed staple altogether. So after rice, wheat, and milk, Bananas are used the most, especially actually in the lower developed world, to cook. 
It's also, what we might not realize, one of the most profitable items in the supermarkets. You might not think so when you go into a store, you pay 29 cents or 39 cents for an organic one, but actually the profit margin is enormous. So it has a lot of economic clout behind it. And Sam Zamiri, particularly, his involvement in the banana trade really tells a broader history, and that's a history of globalized capitalism. Also a story uh, from rags to riches to some degree, a story of mass consumption at the expense of lower developed countries, and also really a story of humans shaping the environment with lasting political, economic, ecological consequences. And I think that it's really interesting to me when you read this little book about this person who, again, really isn't that well known when you talk to you know average person, listening to People talk about like business tycoons and all that sort of thing. His name usually doesn't come up, but I mean, he personally and this company that he competed against then eventually took over, they had such a huge footprint on the mark of an entire region and even in the United States. So it's crazy. Yep. And Sam Samiri arguably shaped the relations between the United States and Latin America virtually more than any other person who is not involved in politics. So a really important person to learn about. And before we dive into the actual book, I think it is worth at least mentioning the book and kind of how we felt reading it. Rich Cohen, in my opinion, is a really good writer. I thought the account was, if nothing else, extremely entertaining. And I think he did a lot of research. I would say, though, that I feel like there's definitely a tendency to kind of paint Zamuri in a really positive light. To me, it almost was reminiscent of like watching a movie. And Zamuri is definitely the protagonist. and there's kind of an effort and like Cohen acknowledges, you know, a lot of his shortcomings and questionable positions and, and that sort of stuff. But it it always seems like it circles back to the, to the good. And not to say that I think that Zamuri is like a straight up villain. I definitely think there was a less than super critical view of Zamuri in this book. I would definitely agree with you, Arif. Uh, I would say that yes, it is a very entertaining read. Well-written really draws the reader in attention to details, lots of anecdotes that you maybe don't find as much in a very hyper-academic book where it's more about the argument. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, he does really well. But it's also an unusual take on Zamiri. It's definitely more optimistic about his overall legacy. And while there is nuance where he criticizes Zamiri's wrongdoings, and especially United Fruit Company's wrongdoings, nonetheless, it's probably most optimistic take or romanticized take Mm -hmm. on Zamiri that I found anywhere. Yes. of this writing. Would you say in like the reading that you've done, historians are generally more critical of Zamarian United Fruit Company? Absolutely. Yeah. Probably well-deserved. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's reason to criticize him, to say the least. Oh, yeah. And we'll get into those reasons for sure. So with that, I would recommend that you pick up this book. Just read it with a critical eye and understand that there's plenty of other books that talk about Zamuri and United Fruit Company and some of the less romanticized version. Yes. And at the end of the podcast, we'll talk about some further reading that we would recommend to you guys as cool. well. So with that, we'll jump right in, and we will talk about Sam Zamuri's early life. There's not a ton written about his very, very early years. We know that he was born in 1877 in the region of Western Russia, once known as Bessarabia. I believe that is Moldova today. He grew up on a wheat farm, but emigrated to the U.S. with his aunt following his father's death when he was in his early teens. They came here to Selma, Alabama, via New York City. And the reason that they went to Selma, which to me kind of, without the background knowledge, it's not like everyone was flooding to Selma, Alabama for an Eastern European Jew. Doesn't seem like the preferred landing spot, but that is where he ended up going. And that was because his uncle actually already was sort of established there. He had a little uh, store. And at 18, in Selma, Alabama, was where Sam first saw his first banana. And this kind of speaks to what we touched on with Cohen sort of romanticizing Sam's story. It's kind of hard to tell where Cohen is inserting his own vision of Zamuri. But nonetheless, that is my primary source for this book. I will interject that, you know, Cohen describes Sam as kind of like a hustler from the minute he sets feet down in Selma, that he was always looking to make a buck some way. He was picking up odd jobs whenever he could. He worked a lot for his uncle, but that didn't last for too long because Sam kind of got bored there and he decided to travel to Mobile, Alabama, where fruit boats arrived from Central America and purchase a supply of his own and then sell them to people in Selma. And so that was his first entree into the world of selling fruit. 
Yeah, and in Mobile, Alabama, he very much kept the spirit of hard work, turned the buck really quickly here and there. Mobile itself at the time was in the late 1800s was an industrial port town. Banana trade there was dominated by Boston fruit, of what would become later on United Fruit. And it was difficult, difficult work working with bananas. Back then, you didn't have cranes or anything along those lines. You physically had to move bananas and unload them. So, and that was backbreaking and dangerous work. Why was it dangerous? Well, one of the reasons, other than, of course, your back breaking or anything along those lines, was that banana plants were a favorite hangout for scorpions. And, you know, it's interesting, too, that you say banana plant, because I have read this book before a few years ago, but I completely forgot by the time I read it again that bananas do not technically come from trees. You know, people think of the banana tree, but it is a banana plant. It, I believe it was technically an herb or something like that, or a tall grass. Right. So it's like the tallest grass in the world. And that actually makes then bananas berries. So I thought that was interesting. And, and, you know, like Marcus was saying, Sam gets to Mobile and he goes down to the docks because that's where all these bananas are being unloaded from these ships. And he sees these people. Like It's hard to imagine having to do this kind of unloading. We're talking about like hundreds and hundreds of pounds that people are having to move physically without the assistance of any kind of crane, without much technology at all. And these things are basically shipped by the tree. They didn't have refrigeration, so they had to, or advanced refrigeration, I should say. So they really had to try to keep these on the stem for as long as they could. Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why banana work was always associated with this pungent smell, Mm -hmm. really bad smelling bananas. And really where Zamiri was an innovator that was really unique was that he found a niche in the banana trade. The most sold banana type were the, the greens or the yellows. The greens were the money makers because obviously by virtue of being green, they were still ripe, could last a long time, could be shipped much, much farther. Or the yellows that had, were classified by one freckle and they were sold to a discount on markets and to fruit peddlers. I think it's funny too when you think about it nowadays because you know, if you go to a store and you see a bunch of greens, I personally avoid those <laughs> because I'm like, I don't want to wait for these to ripen for me to be able to eat them. But for these fruit companies, especially in the day of very low grade refrigeration, you had to use those to sell, to ship across the country or to wherever you're shipping to. So I thought it was interesting that the greens were the money makers. Yep. We've gotten spoiled with refrigeration. Uh, obviously never freeze a banana or we'll turn very, very brown. Unless you want to make banana bread. That would work. In which case you want to freeze that banana. It's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was a Mary though at the time, obviously of refrigeration, it was much more limited though. Was a genius in a certain way because he saw that the times were ripe, pun intended, (laughs) for ripe bananas. So those that were classified as ripe bananas were those that had two or more freckles. And dealers figured that they wouldn't have time to get them to the market because of the poor refrigeration. And what Zemiri did was say, no, actually, there is a way to turn those if you deal with them really, really quickly. And so his genius really lay in the fact that he was able I had a very, very large discount to buy those bananas en masse and still flip them, almost pun intended as well, in a due manner and make a lot of money out of it. Yeah, and I thought it was, it was really interesting, the scene that Cohen describes of him in Mobile. And again, it kind of speaks to his willingness to outwork, outhustle other people. It also kind of speaks to the idea that Boston Fruit, or maybe it was United Fruit by this time, I don't remember is a huge company. And a lot of times you see these huge companies that aren't nimble anymore. They're not able to think and, or I shouldn't say not able to think, but they don't often think about these little niches. And so Sam saw they're throwing out the ripe bananas. Here are these like delicious fruit. Like when you eat a banana, you're eating a ripe banana and they're throwing them out because by the time they get them to market, they're not going to be able to sell them. And so he, you know, has a limited amount of money, but he approaches these people from Boston Fruit and he says, I'll buy how many pounds of bananas from you. And he spent $150 on, I believe it was a few thousand, and then he purchased a boxcar. And he had spent all his money on his bananas, so he didn't even get a train with a car for him to sleep in. He slept with the bananas back in the car. The clock was ticking. He basically had roughly three days to be able to get them back to Selma, and that's about how long the trip was supposed to take. But there's all these technical issues, and so he's freaking out watching his bananas rot in this train as like days are added on. And so what he ends up doing is telegraphing ahead using Western Union 
and making deals with the telegraph operators to different towns. And so every time the train stopped, he had people, fruit peddlers, people from markets and that sort of stuff waiting for him at each stop. And then he would sell to them. And he ended up making it all the way back to Selma and not only recouping his investment, but making $40, which is $40 then, profit, which is actually pretty good. So $40 on his, I believe, $150 investment initially. That is how he got his start. And he was like, wow, this process actually worked very well. And so he kind of fine-tuned and repeated it over and over again. And he kind of got the nickname Sam the Banana Man. Right. And think about this. I mean, this is really someone who is basically reusing, recycling trash. Mm -hmm. Bananas rotting in the water, which, by the way, is not a good idea if you don't like rats and all those things. But uh, (laughs) he took those, bought them really, really cheaply and became a millionaire over time. Yeah. This didn't take long for his business to really take off. In 1899, he sold 20,000 bananas, roughly. And by 1903, he was selling 574,000. So, you know, it didn't take long at all for him to grow this business. Right. And that's the same year, 1903, where he also met Andrew Preston, who at the time was in charge of the United Fruit Company. And I think at this time, maybe uh, Eric can tell us a little bit about the history of the the United Fruit Company. Andrew Preston was running uh, United Fruit Company at this point. He was one of the founders of the company, actually, as well. Just a brief rundown. He was a prominent American businessman at the turn of the 20th century. In 1884, Preston and nine others formed the Boston Fruit Company. Later in 1899, Preston and a guy we're going to talk about here in a minute named Minor Keith combined their ventures to form the United Fruit Company. And when these two came together, and Marcus is going to talk about who Keith was a little bit more in depth, but I'll just say real quick that when these two came together, Keith was already in Latin America. He was like the supply guy. He was rough around the edges, if I recall correctly from reading Cohen's book, but Preston kind of had the knack for business and sales. And Yeah, and Keith really was, like many other banana men, controversial. So he had this infamous, but also, I guess, rugged image of being a heavy, very heavy worker, really, uh, in all the years that he worked in Latin America, Central America specifically, he never took off a single day. I have to interject because I have a question. Cohen refers to the region a lot as the Isthmus. Where is that specifically referring to? The Isthmus is almost basically the equivalent to saying Central America. It's the narrower parts of Central America that connect the Atlantic to the Pacific. For those out there who aren't sure what countries constitute Central America, what countries are those? So those are starting with Guatemala in the north. There is Belize, although we don't talk about Belize very much here. That was a British colony back then known as British Honduras. There's Honduras itself, El Salvador, Guatemala, Costa Rica, Panama, that's going south. And then South America starts with Colombia. All right, perfect. So I accidentally said that the Isthmus connects the Pacific to Atlantic. How dare you? I know. Some horrible, PhD horrible. out here making mistakes. And it's not entirely incorrect, but what I really meant to say is that the Isthmus connects the Pacific to the Gulf of the Caribbean, and the Gulf of Caribbean connects to the Gulf of Mexico, which by extension connects the Atlantic. There you go. So I completely cut you off and got us off track. You were talking about Minor Keith. Yeah, so Minor Keith was uh, pretty controversial in general, uh, partly because he had this rugged image, but also because his work practices were, to say the least, flawed. The rugged image is that he was a very heavy worker. He never took a single day off. Even Costa Rican workers, and he was especially active in Costa Rica in his earlier days, the Costa Rican workers really respected him for his hard work attitude. He never took a single day off, like I just said. And he, but he was also a very heavy drinker, so you almost always saw him with a bottle at the plantation. Now, you could think that's not controversial very much so if you consider the very heavy alcohol consumption that was very much common in Latin America because it was backbreaking work. And obviously, we have the stereotype, even in the United States, of the Irish being very heavy drinker at work, drinkers at work while building the railroad together with the Chinese because it was so hard of work. The really controversial part about Keith, though, is that his railroad construction in Costa Rica left to about 5,000 Costa Ricans who died at work. Because in order to get your crops out to the coast, especially to the Gulf of the Caribbean or Gulf of Mexico, depending on where you were, you needed a railroad to transport it really quickly. Remember, the bananas are ripening really, really fast. But that took a very heavy toll on the workers. And so that's definitely the part that has stigmatized them ever since. In reading about some other figures who you know, were alive in the turn of the century, and I'm thinking in particular of Dwight Eisenhower when Melvin and I covered him for one of the early episodes of the podcast. 
there is this image of this region, and especially in Guatemala, I remember the author of the Eisenhower biography talking specifically about Guatemala as like the Wild West, like the extension of the Wild West. Like you could think of the American West from 60 years earlier or whatever. We're talking about Buffalo Bill and we have Jesse James. So Cohen plays that up. I don't actually know if you you have any insight into this, but it seemed to me from reading Eisenhower's biography that this might have been an image that was, may have been accurate, but also at the very least may have been perceived by other people because at one point Eisenhower wanted to graduate from West Point and then go to Guatemala specifically and basically play cops and robbers Wild West style. Right, and that's a very old history that, of course, has a lot to do with the American imagination of right. others. So talk about Manifest Destiny. It was a very long time, if it hadn't been for slavery, where the United States might have annexed other territories of Latin America to become U.S. parts. And, of course, very famously, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, about whom you will talk one day, mm -hmm. I, I've heard. Oh, yeah. Multiple um, volumes of Teddy Roosevelt. Very famously. <laughs> <laughs> very famously, he went to hunt in Brazil in the jungles. It was seen as something at a time in which gender was constructed very much in binaries mm -hmm. that made men strong. And Eisenhower must have thought something very similar about Guatemala. So, again, I got you completely off track. And we were talking about some of these practices by Minor Keith before he joined with Andrew Preston and about how, you know, he had all these dangerous labor practices that were causing Colombians to die left and right to get these bananas out. So if you want to pick up there. Yes. Yeah, so as Preston and Keith united their businesses, they had a very large presence, not just in the Caribbean, but also in Central America. We just talked about the Isthmus to some degree. And of course, a company with such power was very soon involved in controversies, and not just the controversies of workers dying en masse by clearing jungles and creating or laying railroad track, but also by intermeddling with certain U.S. Uh, objectives, something to which we'll come back over and over again. Over and over again. <laughs> so one of the earlier controversies of the United Fruit Company was, for instance, a standoff between Teddy Roosevelt, we just talked about, and the United Fruit Company. Roosevelt was president between 1901 and 1909, and one of his most famous accomplishments was, of course, to continue the construction of the Panama Canal that the French had started 20 years earlier. And what Roosevelt needed more than anything else was workers. And the best workers, almost in a stereotype, were from the West Indies. And American companies paid much, much better, much higher wages to workers from the West Indies than the United Food Company did to banana workers. And so if we live in a world of incentives, and generally speaking, we do, although incentives are not everything, if we live in that world, it made sense, of course, that a lot of workers, rather than working for the United Food Company, went to the Panama Canal. And the United Food Company really uh, became annoyed with the Teddy Roosevelt administration over the construction of the Panama Canal. Never mind that the company itself would benefit very largely from the construction of the Panama Canal, because again, it united both large oceans. By the extension of the Caribbean Sea, it united the Atlantic to the Pacific. Thereby, cutting the shipping distance of over 8,000 miles and not relying on railroad as much anymore either. Another controversy, just about 10 years later, under the Woodrow Wilson administration, also enveloped the United Fruit Company in controversy with the United States government. In that case, Wilson, a progressive, at least in a domestic sense, economically, wanted to tax bananas. And perhaps indicative of what was to come with the United Fruit Company having an enormous lobbying body that could influence politicians across countries, what happened was that the United Fruit Company set in motion lobbyists who knocked on the doors of several politicians in D.C. and made clear that the United Fruit Company was not to be taxed. Gotta that, love lobbyists. Yes, lobbyists... Um, make the world go round. Yeah, make the world go round <laughs> and are as important today as they were 100 years ago. And that's exactly what happened. So here already is obvious to us that the United Food Company deserved its nickname, the octopus, because its tentacles went everywhere, whether it was bribing and giving kickbacks to people in Central America who were politically powerful, or whether it was lobbying against tax efforts in Washington, D.C., it was a very, very powerful company. And then what's it's El Pulpo? Is that how you El say it? And yep. I'm not going to try to say that again. So it will be the octopus to me. Marcus, you can say it that way if you'd like to. <laughs> it will be the octopus for me as well. Yeah, again, you know, another interjection for me. As any of you who listened to our series on Shanghai Shek were able to realize that Melvin speaks Chinese and I only speak English, Marcus speaks a bunch of other languages that I don't speak. So if Marcus wants to interject his fancy languages, that's perfectly fine with me, but you will be getting mispronunciations left and right from your boy. Yep, I'll be happy not to do so for two reasons. 
The first is that my German accent is even stronger in Spanish and Portuguese <laughs> than it is in English. Well, most of our listeners wouldn't know the difference. So. <laughs> uh, and the second part is that uh, one thing that always bothers me is when certain instructors, especially in their English, instructing in English, mm. pronounce the Spanish words so ostentatiously in Spanish <laughs> that it becomes like, and now let's move on to Nicaragua. <laughs> so uh, in that sense, I'm, I'm purposely issuing that kind of pronunciation. And with all that being said, you can clearly see how United Fruit was constantly in need of more supply in the 20th century. And Sam, with his hustler's mentality or whatever you want to call it, seems to be, even at this point, when he's not associated with United Fruit, to be a perfect fit. And spoiler alert, guys, he will go on until his death to play a huge role in shaping United Fruit Company and the politics of the region. And that basically started from as soon as he met with Preston. But by this point, he's 21 years old and he had accumulated $100,000, which would have made him a millionaire today. And this is just by selling those ripes. You know, he had kind of expanded that operation, but he hadn't been doing anything but selling what United Fruit considered trash. And he had already made himself a millionaire. So really, in a lot of senses, if he had packed it in right then and there, he would have been a success story, you know? But Cohen paints this picture of Sam as like extremely hungry, like always, always wanting more. And um, you can kind of see that later on in his life too. Yeah. And speaking to his success, when he was 21, he could actually pay for his grandparents, parents, and six of his siblings to immigrate from present day Moldova, as Arabia, to the United States. So with that being said, Sam was still hungry and he wanted more. And he was like, there's only so many ripe bananas. <laughs> so he really wanted to start moving into more of the traditional supplier role. And so that meant buying up greens, buying up yellows and that sort of thing. One of the problems was, and Cohen talks about this a lot, I forget at some point, I'll think a little bit later in the book, but Sam, even though he's in these cities, a lot of times that were accepting of immigrants and, or, you know, broadly accepting of immigrants and of Jews and that sort of thing, he never fit in anywhere because still the dominant culture and religion was, you know, of like white Protestants in, in a lot of these cities. And then, you know, you had Catholics too, and then you had Western European Jews. One might think that, okay, there is a significant population of Jews there. He should fit right in. Well, there was a dichotomy or a schism, you know, whatever you want to call it between like the Western European Jews and the Eastern European Jews. And the way that Cohen describes it in the book is that a lot of Western European Jews kind of look down on these Eastern European Jews as like less civilized or not as informed in the ways of polite society and, and that sort of thing. So he was kind of always an outsider no matter where he went. And so when he went to try to expand this business, he needed someone to kind of, I guess, like legitimize him, you know, I guess like being vastly successful by doing something that no one else had ever done before isn't enough. So he had to go and find a partner. And that partner was a guy named Ashbel Hubbard. And they came together in 1903. And we forgot to mention that earlier, when Sam met Preston of United Fruit, they had made a deal that basically let Sam purchase all of United Fruit's ripes. And so that's a ton of bananas. And that is kind of what led to Sam having so much success early on. So going back to Sam's meeting with Ashbell Hubbard in 1903, he also had a contract with United Fruit because another reason that United Fruit got the name The Octopus was because they had their tentacles wrapped around all their competitors as well. They had this practice of whenever there was a smaller company who may or may not be successful, they would buy a portion of that company. So like, okay, if my competitor gets really successful, I'm also going to get, you know, a chunk of that. It's kind of like hedging your bets. And so they had more or less done that with Sam in the supplier's contract that they had with him. And they've done that with Hubbard's contract, but Hubbard had more of a traditional company and contract with them selling bills and greens. And like I said, Hubbard gave Sam some quote unquote legitimacy in the eyes of lenders. And so they were much more comfortable investing in a company that also had Hubbard attached to it. And they needed capital because they wanted to buy from farmers, but they didn't really have capital. So that's why they needed those lenders. They formed the Hubbard Zamuri Company. And they started with $30,000. In 1905, they purchased the Thatcher Brothers Steamship Company for $10,000. The bulk of that money came from United Fruit, who was a 25% silent partner in their deal. The purchase of these steamships made 
this company, you know, quote unquote legitimate in the eyes of a lot of people, because before they were kind of like, there's a dime a dozen of these kind of companies, these fruit peddlers who would buy from United Fruit and other people and try to flip them for a small profit. But now they have a fleet of ships, even if it's kind of a broken down, outdated fleet, it's a fleet nonetheless. And so they look like a real company. And this opened up a lot of opportunity for them, opened uh, waterfront markets for them as far as the Gulf of Mexico. They also purchased the near defunct Kaimel Fruit Company. And it's funny because the company was failing. Like the company was worth virtually nothing. But what it did have was a list of deeds to land that they may or may not have owned. It's not like today, and especially if you're listening in like the US or whatever, of like, oh, I have this deed. This land is definitely mine. That was not the case necessarily in some of the areas that Kaimel held deeds to. It was like, yes, you have a claim to this land. But so might someone else. So it was really a gamble for them to spend the money to buy those. What is interesting about the Cuyamel Fruit Company is that most of their holdings were in Honduras. And Honduras would tie down Sam for many years, if not decades to come. A really, really important part. Also, by virtue of purchasing the Cuyamel Fruit Company, Zamuri's personal land holdings of his company grew from 100 to 5,000 acres overnight. So really an, an enormously important purchase. For those of you who generally listen to The Life of X, you know that Melvin and I go off on all kinds of tangents all the time. This is obviously not going to be any different. Additionally, our outline is loosely based off of the structure that Cohen uses in his book. And so he does a lot of thematic stuff too. So while we are going to follow chronologically with Zamuri's life and that sort of thing, when Cohen breaks in with a thematic topic or something like that, we're also going to do the same. So at this point with Zamuri, we're talking about it's 1905 or early 1900s, that decade. So don't lose track of that in your head. But for the next few minutes, we're going to talk about the banana itself. The banana actually has a pretty old history. A lot of us might think that the banana originally comes from Latin America or anything, but that's really not true at all. The banana had its origins in either Southeast Asia or the Pacific region around 5,000 to 8,000 years ago. So really a very, very old history. It slowly but surely made its way westward to Eastern Africa, Western Africa, and didn't really uh, arrive in Latin America until 1516 when a friar planted it there. The banana has a lot of unusual advantages, but also a lot of disadvantages as a fruit to plant. And obviously that's important to know because the banana influenced Sumeri's life almost as much as he influenced banana's life. So one of the advantages of bananas are that they're never out of season. They grow really fast. They're easy to plant. And uh, whereas we might think of the banana very much omnipresent in our lives today because it's the most consumed fruit out of all fruits, you might think it's the apple, but actually people consume more bananas and apples every year. It wasn't really known very much in the United States until the late 19th century. It was actually so much of a rarity that in 1876, it was still shown at the World Exposition in Philadelphia. To your point, I thought it was really interesting. Cohen does a really good job of describing the fact that most people in the United States and in other parts of the world, but definitely in the United States, had never seen a banana before United Fruit made them so widespread. That's right. So. One of the reasons why the banana is difficult to plant in some way, so it's easy to plant in a way because it grows all season, like I said. It also grows really fast. There are also some complications. And one of the reasons is that in order to grow more bananas, you almost never get a seed. Actually, as a matter of fact, it can take thousands and thousands of banana plants, remember they're plants, to get one single seed. As a matter of fact, the banana type that we have today, the Cavendish, doesn't produce any seeds at all. Yeah, and in that way, every banana you've eaten is basically just like a clone. And, you know, we'll see later in our tale that while this lends itself to mass production, it also lends itself to being wiped out very quickly if there's any kind of a blight or anything like that. And so, again, we will touch on that. Right, and, and since uh, they are clones, uh, there was this great quip by the magazine, The New Scientists. And the quip was, that the banana hasn't had sex for thousands of years. <laughs> so very similar to the bananas we had uh, thousands of years ago, that's still what we're eating today when you look at the Cavendish. And this lack of reproduction really made it vulnerable to disease. So once a parasite or a disease affects the banana, it's very much possible that the entire plantation or even the entire species is threatened from that disease. And so how did United Fruit Company, back at the time still with the Big Mike or the Gros Michel, as it was known in French, how did they deal with that? Well, like very often what happens in agriculture, 
If you can't deal with a disease, you just add more chemicals to deal with that disease. Really, that wasn't always very successful. Today, out of all fruits that we know, no major food crop actually receives more chemicals than a banana. And the only hope that we have of not being poisoned whenever we eat a banana is this very old idea that the skin of the banana, even though it's permeable, at least protects us from the worst of it. Isn't so permeable. <laughs> yeah, it's not so permeable, exactly. At least less so than the peel of a potato, which of course you should always peel your potatoes. You know, it's interesting too, and I'm sorry again for the interruption, but you mentioned the Big Mike banana, which is, you know, what they sold for the majority of their time. Like this is what United Fruit was selling and, and what Sam was selling. That has since gone extinct. But the bananas that, you know, you'll see in like a cartoon or something like that, where like someone eats a banana peel and throws it on the ground and then like someone trips over it. Like that's the Big Mike. Like the Big Mike was a larger banana and it had that thicker, slippable banana peel. That's right. And that's why you don't see those banana jokes at all anymore. Yeah, doesn't make sense. Not going to slip on a Cavendish peel. <laughs> that's right. And because banana had the peel on which you could slide or not, that's why also the United Fruit Company and other companies advertise it as the most hygienic of all fruits. So we have talked about bananas now and their origins and how they have advantages and disadvantages to being grown. We've also talked to some degree about republics. But what we haven't really talked about is the word banana republic. Do you mean the clothing company? <laughs> I've not thought about that at all. <laughs> no, a banana republic as a term. And that was a term that was coined by O. Henry, an author with the real name of William Sidney Porter, but more famously O. Henry, of course, uh, that came up in his novel Cabbages and Kings in 1904. He modeled the term of Banana Republic on a romanticized version of Honduras and its supposedly happy plantation life that workers were enjoying. The irony of all this is, of course, is that the United Fruit Company, through bribes and corruption, very much invented this concept and reality of the Banana Republic, as Peter Chapman puts it in one of his books. So yeah, that is a word on the banana. Speaking of United Fruit, we've already touched on kind of their early years and how they were formed, but there was a couple more things that I wanted to, to touch on before that. And really, it was just how they became so large. At the time when they were growing these bananas, we've already kind of talked to the point that bananas are kind of a brittle crop, that they can be wiped out very easily by disease, but also by like weather. Uh, you know, one like hurricane or whatever, one major storm or bad weather spell, uh, whatever you want to call it, can really wipe out an entire crop. And so when Boston fruit was trying to grow before the United fruit and after United fruit, they were having a lot of trouble getting investors and borrowing money from banks because it was seen as extremely risky. Like one bad storm and you're out of business, basically, or you're going to miss an entire however long of profits. So their strategy was that, well, how we do, how we're going to avoid that is we're going to buy everywhere. Like we're going to buy land all over the place and, you know, chances are they're not all going to get hit. So it was their kind of idea of diversification to avoid risk. And they also were very leery of antitrust law, which, you know, if you've listened to our episode and our series on Andrew Carnegie, you will have been acquainted or well acquainted with the Sherman Antitrust Act and stuff like that. But basically they needed to show that there were competitors because these antitrust laws would have come in and made them split into separate companies if they if they weren't able to do so and their way of propping up their competition was to invest in their competition and you know I'd already talked about that a little bit but that was the reasoning behind it like not because they loved competition but because they wanted to make it look like they weren't as dominant as they really were so now we're going to go back and talk about the man Sam Zimmer again it is 1905 and he moved to New Orleans which was you know a giant port city a funny note that I picked up on from Cohen was how eccentric Sam could be about, especially around his diet. It reminded me a lot of reading Walter Isaacson's Steve Jobs biography, because if any of you have listened to our series on Steve Jobs, you'll remember that Steve was always experimenting with weird diets and that sort of thing. And, and Sam was the same way. He would have months where he would only eat figs or something like that, or like only bananas before 6 p.m. and then, or only meat. And then he would stand on his head or whatever because he thought it aided in digestion. Kind of an eccentric guy, kind of speaks to the kind of person he was, always hustling, always working and eating strange patterns and strange things. But anyway, 28 years old, he's in New Orleans, this giant port city. He's still unmarried. And, you know, I kind of talked about this before, that wherever he was, he was an outsider, and it was no different in New Orleans. The majority of the wealthy were Catholic or Protestant. The city was, by the standards of the day, very friendly to Jews, but again, most of them were uh, Western European Jews, and they would 
kind of look down on an Eastern European like Sam. And that's really interesting about Cohen, because as you probably gathered earlier, he likes to write about Jewish history. And he really opens up a new angle about this Jewish aspect of Zamiri's identity. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about this when we actually get there. But there's one thing about the book that I noticed, kind of a critique, was that he kind of, in my opinion, inserts his own assumptions about Sam's Jewish identity. Because as we'll see, Sam was not a particularly religious person. He, He wasn't really even that culturally connected, it didn't seem like, until later on in life. And even then, he didn't, and I, we're going off on a tangent, which is, you know, not unusual to the listeners of Life of X, but, you know, he didn't marry a Jewish girl. He didn't uh, attempt to raise his children as Jews necessarily. And so I would say that was one, one critique I had of Cohen was that it seems like he was almost projecting this identity onto Sam. Absolutely. I was going to say verbatim, he, <laughs> he seems to project his own identity uh, onto him. In a way, for instance, one of the phrases sent out is, there's no way for us to know, but I assume right. <laughs> that uh, Sam's biggest regret in his whole life was that he didn't raise his children in a more Jewish way. Right. I remember reading that and like, wow, <laughs> that's <laughs> quite the assumption. It's, it's bold. Right. It's bold. But anyway, so like I said, Sam was not particularly religious at this point in his life. If anything, he worshipped capitalism at the altar of the wharves in New Orleans. And <laughs> so he was just focused solely on growing this business. He didn't have time for a wife. He didn't have time for anything else. And he ended up hiring a man who Cohen describes as, you know, quote unquote, washed up banana man, uh, Jacob Weinberger. And he was an old school, I guess you could call him, old school banana man, at least from the generation before Sam. He was, you know, familiar with the Ithmus and he was Sam's like, general problem solver, basically. Like, if he needed something done, he would go to Jacob. And he also took a liking to Jacob's daughter, Sarah. So Sarah and Sam got married in 1908. They had their first child, Doris, in 1909. And according to Cohen, this really increased Sam's drive to succeed. As if he wasn't already driven enough to grow the business, having two people now that depended on him not just himself. We didn't go into it too deep, but Sam never had any problem roughing it from Cohen's description. He was fine sleeping in the train car with the bananas or, you know, sleeping on the ground in Guatemala or whatever. But he has a child, he has a wife now, and like they depend on him. And so he really feels this push to provide for them. And, you know, with this partnership with Weinberger, who was still in business, but running it at a much slower clip than before, he decides that he's going to take his first extensive tour of Honduras in 1910. He first arrives in a town called Puerto Cortes. Uh, It's bad, but that's how I'm going to say it. And again, it kind of goes back to Cohen's romanticism of the region and the time and all that, but he really describes it like a lawless town filled with gunslingers and criminal American expats because at the time there was no extradition treaty between the U.S. and uh, Honduras. So a lot of people could just rob a bank and get down to Honduras and be safe. Yeah, very much, again, epitomizes this idea of the Wild West extend itself. Yeah. So he stays for a few nights, and, you know, it's a few nights of heavy drinking with cowboys and that sort of stuff by Cohen's description. And then he heads off to tour Honduras on muleback. This kind of was one of the instances that Cohen shows one of the, the negative aspects of Sam's view of people in this industry. But at the same time, it wasn't, much different than anyone else, or any different, I should really say. While Sam was touring in Honduras, he talked about and he thought of the people who would be his employees as nothing more than another resource. Mark has already talked about how working conditions and stuff were not good in this period. This kind of touches on why that was, I guess. That like to a lot of these American businessmen who come down here with all this money and who are focused on industry and that sort of thing, the people are not necessarily, I guess people. They're a resource. You know, they're something that you can use to make money. And at the same time, though, even though he did treat him as a resource, he also, maybe similar to Keith, earned a certain respect from some workers for for many reasons. But one of them was that he also was somewhat of a rugged figure. Mm -hmm. He would be there with the machete, at least in his earlier days, slicing down trees, slicing down plants. And he was a very, very hard worker. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Yeah, he certainly wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty. And, you know, he was always drinking with his employees and, and that sort of stuff. And, and, you know, from Cohen's account, the people who actually worked with him and worked for him had a pretty positive view of him, especially early on. So he's over there with the intention to expand the Zamuri Hubbard Company's holdings, purchase more land. And 
And it's kind of funny because we'll see this a little bit later too, but Hubbard was much more conservative in terms of wanting to expand. Like he realized that the business needed to, but he wanted to take on less debt. And Sam was like, we just need to expand, expand, expand. So they're, they're borrowing every dollar they can. And Sam is just throwing money at people to, to buy this land up. And so Sam purchases 5,000 acres near um, Amoa, which was a small colonial town. And he purchased it for $2,000. And that's a lot of land. But to him, he was like, I need more. So Sam goes back to the United States to try to scrounge up more money. And, you know, this is already making Hubbard uncomfortable because, like I said, he was a very conservative businessman. And Sam was all about getting that leveraged money. And so with a coffer full of money, Sam returned to Honduras the same year again with a plan. And the plan was basically just to go north of the delta of the Cuyama River. Remember, he owned the Cuyama Company. And to buy up as much land as possible. All with this board money he had just received from the United States, from different lenders there. What, again, Zimuri was so good at was to have an informational advantage and to really exploit that. Because very few people in Honduras, remember we live at a time in which information flowed so much more slowly. Very few people really realized in Honduras how valuable the land was that he had, that he had just purchased. He also was very gifted in reaching out to locals and to other workers. He paid relatively well, actually 10 times the going rate for day laborers. So imagine how attractive that would be if you're a manual laborer and all of a sudden you earn 10 times as much, so made himself popular. At the same time, could also benefit from the expertise and from their trust and further expand his plantations. Having said that, the rate might have been very high for day laborers to work for him, but both his businesses, but also the United Fruit Company, more broadly speaking, the working conditions were horrifying. And we touched on that earlier, but I want to expand on that a little bit. So while banana workers earned more than workers in the coffee or sugar plantations, their work was nonetheless dreadful and slavery-like. You had to deal with mosquitoes. You had to clear forests and swamps. That was especially dreadful. There were certain demands on you. Yes, you got paid well, but sometimes workers were supposed to clear one hectare every week on their own. Imagine one hectare of jungle. That's, of course, not to say that all of Guatemala or Honduras or anything in Central America was jungle, but it was hard terrain to work in. Even harder, you could argue, than anywhere in the Western U.S. And they're doing this with machetes. With machetes, that's (laughs) right. That's pretty pretty difficult. Workers often also uh, spend much of their paychecks at overpriced company stores. That's a very American idea that the company has certain stores set up, nothing else is really accessible, and workers end up spending most of their paycheck on booze or overpriced food. And one more thing about these company towns that I just want to interject that that caught my eye when I was reading this was that they were a very hierarchical company. So when they built these company towns, they made sure that like management for that area was on the hill. And everyone else, you know, like junior management was also on the hill, but lower. And then the workers were down at the base of the hill. And I thought it was funny too, that if there wasn't a hill where they were building, they built a hill just to put the house on it. Also interesting in that sense is, of course, that there were racial divisions. Very obviously, mostly people in charge of the companies were white Americans, and many of them also from the U.S. South, with memories of slavery, who had fewer compunctions about the mistreatment of workers. Yes, they were paid, but their life was still expendable. Their, their labor was expendable. One question I actually wanted to interject, because there was talk about this in the book, and you know we'll return to it, but a lot of what Cohen talks about for these people that later on United Fruit will prop up was that they had a quote-unquote like Indian look to them, or like native. Can you talk a little bit about the ethnic breakdown in the region? Sure. So Central America especially is known as one of the most indigenous areas of Latin America. Whereas we're talking about the Mayans in Guatemala and southern Mexico, or of course the Aztecs of Nahuas in northern and central Mexico. There were also many uh, indigenous smaller tribes in Central America. So there is a very much a large indigenous population and a large mestizo population, which means mixed between white Spaniards back from colonial times, or Portuguese in, in Brazil would be mestizos, with indigenous elements. And of course, similar to the United States, if perhaps less extreme so, economic hierarchies were very much premised on that the whiter you were, the more powerful and the wealthier you were. Okay, so the people who Cohen would describe as quote-unquote Indian-looking or whatever, they would be on the bottom of the hierarchy. Yeah, other than perhaps Afro-Indigenous or just Afro-Latin Americans, who, because of slavery, which lasted in Latin America until the 1820s, roughly, were at the very, very bottom of society, 
and continue to be marginalized. Uh, but really, it's difficult to compare those hierarchies at some point today, but they, they continue to last. Cool. I just want to touch on that because I know it's going to come into play later, but please go ahead. Another complication of working on those plantations wasn't just nature and the company towns and the very strong hierarchical structures, but also that the United Fruit Company used a network of spies and foremen to suppress labor unrest. And whereas there was a stereotype almost, especially of West Indians, of being docile, because a lot of West Indians were imported from the West Indies, so parts of the Caribbean, especially British Caribbean, to Central America because workers were always sought for, whereas there is the stereotype of their being docile, in reality there was labor unrest. So one of the revolts that we saw very early by workers needs to be understood partly in the context of the October Revolution. Now Melvin talked a little bit about the October Revolution because it influenced Chiang Kai-shek, but of course it influenced people all over the world. It took place, by the way, in November 1917, even though it's called the October Revolution. That's because back then the Soviet Union still had a Julian calendar rather than the Gregorian calendar. This uprising by workers in the Soviet Union, one of the least expected parts in the world where we have workers rising up against the capitalistic system, also influenced, of course, laborers in Latin America. While information traveled slowly, it nonetheless, of course, reached Latin America. And so one of the largest uprisings among workers that we see was in 1918, a labor strike in Colombia. Now, the United Fruit Company had so much power that it basically, one of its tentacles moved in a way that it could shut down the entire economy of a region when there were strikes. And that's exactly what happened in 1918. Workers refused to work, and all that the United Fruit Company did was to ignore it. And that, of course, shows the asymmetric power structures between capitalists who had the money to just hire different workers or to ignore those kind of threats and to move on. However, 10 years later, the strike in Colombia again was much more manifest, was also more violent. All that workers really sought was an eight-hour day and a six-day week, so really 48-hour week, perhaps not too much to demand, that's a judgment call here, <laughs> but that's what they wanted, especially because they saw that that was very common in the United States at that point, so... Back to Wilson in the 19-teens, had reformed a lot of labor laws. Of course, labor units in the United States had been pushing for change for a very long time to work less. And Latin Americans, in that case, Colombians, thought, why can't we have that kind of work week? Why can't we work 48 hours a week? Especially because they saw that white plantation owners themselves didn't work more than that. Well, what happened? And that's one of the largest tragedies, perhaps, in the history of the United Fruit Company. Although we'll talk about some largest tragedies down the road. But one of the worst ones was perhaps that the Colombian government used its troops to crack down on that revolt. Why the Colombian government? Part, of course, was to fear that the United Food Company would just withdraw its capital from the area. If or they... overthrow the government. <laughs> or, exactly, that's exactly <laughs> what it was. Or overthrow the government, because that's what the United States had been doing for decades. The United States had overthrown many governments that didn't create business conditions conducive enough. And what happened in 1828, allegedly, was that a U.S. gunboat was appearing off the coast of Colombia, just near Santa Marta, very beautiful colonial city if you ever get a chance to go. And that made the Colombian government overreact to this threat, cracking down. A thousand workers died. Only one soldier died, again showing the asymmetry of force and power and also, of course, the tentacle of United Fruit, as usual, being there, almost omnipowerful, and getting away with it. Yeah, and you know, it's crazy too, to, you know, for me, having just wrapped up recording with Melvin, our series on Andrew Carnegie, and you know, we, a, lot, a large part of his biography talks about the labor unrest that he dealt with. And it's crazy to see that, you know, over a thousand workers died, and you hardly hear about that unless you study the region. And the stuff in, that happened in the U.S., those strikes that were considered very violent, and that's sort of some fractions of that number, you know what I mean? Not even close. And I feel like they're much more well-known and, and understood. Right, and as we think about the Pullman strike, that's definitely a very, very important aspect of U.S. history or global history that is neglected. But also what almost nobody talks about is one of my favorite statistics just for the U.S. specifically. Between 1870 and 1900, 700,000 people died in the United States at the workplace construction of railroads, whatever else was done, 700,000 more workers died in that 30-year period than in all of the civil war combined. That doesn't even factor in the people who you know, lost limbs and got maimed on the job. So right. And no compensation until Social Security, really, under FDR. Yeah, and you know it's funny coming from Youngstown, which is a lot of labor and, and that sort of stuff. And so 
even now, you know, there's a lot of like union stuff. And a lot of people look at unions today, not to go off on any, any sort of tangent. We would never to, do that. To be too contemporary. But, you know, like today, a lot of people, it seems, think of unions as like antiquated and, and outdated and that sort of thing. But it, it's hard to overstate how necessary they were during this period because there was really nothing protecting people who worked for these large companies. They were quite literally just a resource that could be replaced, and that's exactly how they were viewed. So not to go off too far of a tan- tangent, I'm going to circle back now to talk about Zamuri in this, the context of what Marcus was just talking about. So he meets with emissaries of the Miguel de Bila government to secure what Cohen refers to as quote-unquote concessions, which basically just a way of saying that Sam was bribing the Honduran government. And, you know, not that Sam was the only one doing this. You know, a lot of people did this. This was common practice at the time for these kind of companies. And so he was paying kickbacks, bribes to Dabila and his people and all that. And it was necessary. Not to say that Sam wouldn't have done it if it weren't necessary, but he basically wasn't paying any kind of taxes at all on any of the business he was doing. And he needed that in order to compete at all with United Fruit. If he hadn't had that, Kaimel would have just ceased to exist. And so that will come back a little bit later. But as for right now, it's important to remember that these bribes and everything like that were just kind of how business was done. Right. And then you wonder, why would he do that? Didn't he have a choice? Can you just say, no, you're paying taxes or not? Well, the reality of the situation was that, yes, Cuyame could go belly up. That would be the main issue. But also what happens to all the farmers? Yeah. What choice did they have? Uh, yes, there was a domestic market for bananas, but nothing compared to the powerful, powerful domestic sales markets in the United States. So really, one way, uh, one author put it really, really poignantly was they had two choices. They could refuse that kind of deal. They could also refuse the relatively low pay to receive for their crops, or they could let their crops rot. Yeah, quite the choice. <laughs> yeah. So Sam secures these concessions or sweetheart deal, however you want to think about it. And we've already kind of talked about how he was very hands-on in the early days, kind of endearing himself to the people who worked for him, kind of this like rough and ready figure and rough and tumble guy. And we talked about the construction of these company towns and how they would build them according to the hierarchy and all that sort of thing. And he still wanted to grow and grow and grow because he sees this gigantic monolith that was United Fruit. And he's like, I have to grow to compete with them. The same problem is that he was using borrowed money already. And now he's still poor. He is totally maxed it out. There is no one. And, you know, by this time, Sam is not just relying on people from the region he's from in like New Orleans or the South or whatever. He's going across the country to anyone who will lend, any investor he can find. And they are tapped out. They're like, Sam, your business is risky. Because again, same issues that United Fruit ran into in the early days, like people viewed investing in this kind of venture as very risky. They're like, you're risking our money way too much. I can't give you another dime. And so Sam does something that kind of spells the end of his partnership with Hubbard. And that is that he turns to gangsters to fund this money. And these gangsters have higher than average interest rates. So Sam was sometimes borrowing money at a 50% interest rate. And like I had said, that was it for Hubbard. He, he was like, you're already borrowing way more money than I'm comfortable with, period. But now you're going to borrow from these seedy figures who are probably going to come and break my thumbs if I don't have the money for them. So at that point, he told Sam he wanted out. And so Sam bought him out for roughly $160,000 all in gangster borrowed money. (laughs) So that puts us with Sam now owning 90% of KML Fruit and United Fruit, who still had a stake, owning 10%. Sam, as they would say, his star was rising. He had gangster money behind him to buy as much land up as he possibly could. And he would continue to strive towards being able to buy out United Fruit from his own company and then continue to compete with them. But that is where we are going to wrap up for this episode, and we will pick up there in part two. Marcus, do you have any closing thoughts on what we've covered today? Absolutely not. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you, Marcus, for coming with me on this journey for part one, and we look forward to having you again for part two. As a reminder, guys, if you would like to support the show at all, you can head over to lifeofxpodcast.com and visit our support page. That's all you need to know. Thank you guys very much.